Welcome back. We're looking at the World History Workbook and teaching uh, world history using the work workbook. Just to refresh your memory, this is what it looks like. I am David Herzl, professor of history and the author of this book, but more importantly, I taught this class for 20-something years using basically these projects and, uh, and readings. Today, I'm actually, I have to say, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to talk about Professor Hashem Agajari. One of my favorite experiences in 23 years or 25 years of teaching world history was uh, a student, she was from Cameroon, she was a returning student, maybe 30 when she took my class, maybe a little bit older. Uh, already had children and a family and uh, was, a, was studious, knew what she was doing, going to nursing school. When we are discussing this material, Hashem and the, uh, this, this, this reading that introduces him, after class, the class always had discussion and after discussion was over, I was about to leave and I realized she was still sitting in the, in the classroom, a few rows back from the front. And I walked up to her and I said, is everything okay? And she looked up at me and she was teary-eyed and she was reading this, this lecture that Hashem Agajari gave in Iran. And she said, <laughs> she looked at me and she said, I just really love this man. And I thought, you know, me too. I th he's just, a, just a, a, a wonderful person so persecuted, so violently, imprisoned, threatened with beating, threatened with death for giving this, uh, this, this lecture, which is in the appendix. I believe it's appendix number 13. The, the text introduces Hashem Agajari's lecture and Hashem Agajari in his Iranian society as an example of exchange of cultural exchange, of uh, cross-cultural exchange, of, of exchange between, between societies and civilizations that claim to despise one another, and so on. And he uses this magnificent quote from Woody Guthrie. He says, uh, when, when he was told that somebody had stolen one of his songs, Pete Seeger relates that Woody Guthrie said, well, he just stole from me, I steal from everybody. And of course, Woody Guthrie's right. This is, this is true, that everything has a genealogy. Nothing, nothing is original. Nothing is, is exactly the first. Maybe a combination, but, but, but still the elements are not, uh, are not unique and original. They come from something. Everybody borrows. That's what culture is. That's what society is. And Hashem Agajari is aware of that. And without any, he's a historian. He's an adult when he gave this, this lecture. He, was, he knew what he was talking about, and he also knew the trouble that he was asking for by giving this lecture. He was a war veteran. He was wounded in the war. By the time he gave this lecture, I believe he was a fairly elderly man, um, and still the, the state didn't, the Iranian state didn't care. They, they went after him, arrested him, sentenced him. So the, the, the lesson of cross cultures and exchange of cultures is is important and it's and it's here but there's so many other lessons from this lecture and this discussion it can go so many directions and this is up to the instructor or up to you to allow your mind to examine it in in other ways read read his lecture carefully it's not a great translation it came from iranian.com and i'm and i'm glad that they gave me the uh, the right to use it but it's <laughs> But here and there, it's a little thin. But the but the basic principle comes through. The details uh, come through, and some of the some of the terminology. the The other issues that I think this lecture raises are persecution, freedom of speech, uh, historical accuracy and authenticity, because Hashem Agajari describes the what he believes the Islam of the 21st, early 21st century, 20th century uh, in Iran really required, and that was a Protestant revolution. <laughs> a Protestant revolution 
that might model itself after the uh, European Protestant Revolution or Protestant Reformation. And that was a very provocative thing for him to say because the Iranian clergy and the Iranian elite did not want to have anything to do with that kind of, uh, that kind of model. But he points out, I think beautifully, the, the, the flaws in their, uh, in their position. So it has all of those things, persecution, the individual against the institution, um, exchange of cultures, all of those things that I mentioned. But then what Hashim Aghajari actually says, and the thing that had my student weeping and loving this man, besides his courage, I think, was also an important element, is the content of his, of his lecture. And the content might be might be thought of as a, as a universal or a near universal, maybe not an innate universal in, in, human, uh, in human history, but so repetitive, so instructive, that I think that it could be almost addressed as a universal. And this is his, his construction of uh, core religion and traditional religion. It's also a nice historical exercise for students because they need to abandon what they would normally mean by traditional religion. I think usually tradition would mean something that was sort of core or central or ancient or persistent, but he doesn't, he doesn't use it this way, at least in the translation. He doesn't use it this way. Hashim Aghajari uses uh, traditional to mean that, that religion that is created by practitioners, not by God. Core religion he uses to mean the nature of humanity and the nature of God. Therefore, sort of the pure religion. And he refers to this also as Islam, true Islam, pure Islam. And he has a number, number of instances. The way I get at this with students is by asking them, uh, because he doesn't really, he, he's, not, he's not really detailed and explicit about this, uh, this content. He alludes to it, he uses the terms, but he doesn't really come out and set it up in a, in a clear outline, which is what a lot of uh, GE students want. They, just want. they just want the answer in simple form now. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he kind of um, works around it and uh, provides some of the, uh, the examples. And this is how I lead students to get to the, uh, to the meaning, particularly first of traditional religion and then uh, eventually of core religion. Because he does give examples. He gives the example of the ring, of the dress, of the food, of the, maybe he mentions travel, teaching English used to be forbidden. All of these things that had been part of the traditional practice, many of them which are no longer part of the pr traditional practice. And this is exactly how he knows that these are traditional and not core. They've changed over time. So he's using reason to to set up these categories. He's using some evidence, and the evidence is that these things can't be uh, the commands of, a, of a, uh, an omniscient God because they change. Therefore, they have to be features of the culture, like the Anglo-Saxon blessing. The, all, of those, all of those aspects have changed. So much has changed in religious practice, which raises a really, I think, critical point about literalism, about fundamentalism, that there's, there's sort of an inherent lie in, in, in those literalisms. Because proponents of literalisms, whether they're Hindu or, or, uh, or, uh, is, or Muslim, or Christian or, or, uh, or, or Hebrew, Jewish, they, they presume that the the reading that the words come and emanate directly from God. So when they command people do this, when the, the, the Ar Iranian elite have the, use the Koran as the absolute law, that's the, the absolute word of God, and therefore this law will apply absolutely. But those things change. Readings of it, interpretations, applications of all of those things. Not to mention translations, although not in the case of the, of the Quran that stands as the basis of, of several Islamic, modern Islamic states. Now the language has not, has not been translated. But meanings of words change. Context of words change. So as soon as one of these elites utters words that are claimed to be 
directly from God and therefore absolute and of absolute authority, they've already, they've already corrupted them. They've already corrupted those words because they applied them, they interpreted them, they uh, used them in a circumstance. They, uh, they are the ones who said them. They are the ones who, uh, who applied them. They are the ones who understood their genealogy and their use in the modern world and, and so on. So they, they couldn't be an absolute truth, an absolute eternal truth, even less. And Hashem Aghzari gets to that, and he really gets to that in a magnificent way, I think in a graceful way, in an intelligent way, and also in a very reasoned way. He says these can't be because they've changed. It can't, be the, it can't have been the absolute word of, of truth that it's, it's forbidden or it's wrong to study English because now everybody's studying English and they're saying it's, it's part of the absolute right. It can be good. And the same with, um, with the study of modern science. And this is the, is the issue with the Catholic Church and Galileo as well. And Galileo, and sorry, Hashem Aghzari is aware of that. He, he understands the parallels that, he's, uh, that he uh, is sort of conjuring. So what he says is divine and needs to be followed absolutely is respect for human beings. He says this is, a, this is an absolute universal whether they're Muslims, whether they're Christians, whether they're Iranians or Egyptians or Americans. They, people need to be treated with respect and people need to have inalienable rights. It's, it's really a, a, a powerful call for universal human rights, not only in Iran, but in any religious society, in any society that, that bases its, uh, its principles, its law, in some sort of fundamentalist, absolute uh, literalism, claiming that it's from God, or it's absolute, or it can't be changed, or it can't be questioned, or it can't be challenged. This is a, it's a powerful, a powerful appeal for human rights and for the freedom of speech. And the, uh, his lecture is broken up into, into sections. I don't remember if those, if those sections were part of the, part of the original translation from Iranian.com or not. I, I really do not. But he doesn't really get to what he means by core religion, but he alludes to it, and what he means is without respect for human beings, there is no Islam. So true Islam, he says, is respect for, for human beings. It's basically the humanist principle. And it's basically the principle from Confucius that I, if, if I don't like something done to me, then I shouldn't do it to somebody else. It doesn't matter if they're Muslim or not. Well, he paid a, he paid a, a high price for, uh, for arguing this and for uh, speaking in public about it. But not only my student fell in love with him and, and uh, felt so strongly about him, uh, uh, Iranian students did as well. And when he was arrested, they took to the streets, particularly in Tehran, and uh, they protested. They were arrested, they were beaten, and they were denied their rights. But I think that he's a, he's a although he's not that long ago, this is 2002, we are not monkeys, we are human beings. Very nice. It's not that long ago, and so it's, a, it's actually a little questionable whether or not it's historical. I mean, if it should fall in the category of history or if it should be political science or something. I, I would argue that it's historical and it can be used in history because it's not the first time that happened. This is part of a historical pattern going back a couple thousand years. And certainly it's part of a, of a 19th and 20th century pattern of uh, claims of absolute truth and claims of uh, the authority of that that lead heads of state were sp spoke always on the authority of God. Now it may, it may be kind of more evident in in Iran, where it's the at the very top of the of the um, political classes. There is a religious group who interprets the Quran, and this is this is how they uh, determine correct and incorrect. But it happens in other places as well, and not only Islamic states. It happens in, in many places. It happens in the United States, maybe in cliques, maybe in groups. There's social pressure. There's pressure uh, for people to not think freely, to not speak freely, to not exchange culture, maybe with Muslims, to not, uh, to not adopt principles and ideas from a, an opposing group. This happens everywhere. 
outside group, inside group, we and they, uh, the other, and, and all of those, uh, all of those processes that amount to segregation, and and defense of communities too. I'm not saying this is this is always a terrible thing. It's not, but when it's applied in the way that they apply it in Iran and in many uh, exclusion exclusive exclusive groups. Uh, in American history, to just exclude black people, for example, I mean, this is this is absurd and it's horrible and it's and it's wrong. And I think that he he lays that bare. I think he shows what's wrong about that. So that's Hashem Agajari, and I hope you enjoy him as much as I do and love him as much as my student did. And I I hope he sees this video and he he is aware that not only the Iranians who who respected and honored what, what he said and what he risked his life to say, but it's, it's people from all over the world. Uh, we have one more discussion on this, uh, this chapter about the individual and the institution, and I'll get to that next.